And this preacher, he stopped mid-service and he said, there's someone here, it's like you're pushing a safe through the sand. I thought, that's me. And I usually don't go down the front, but I just went straight down the front. And it's like the Holy Spirit, that's the only way I can describe it. It's like the Holy Spirit jumped off the stage and just went bam. And I instantly buckled and I had these pair of eyes appear to me outside of my body. And I felt this transference of hot liquid love flushing through my spirit, just waves of this love rushing through these eyes. And I just broke. I was smashed to pieces and undone by the love of the Spirit of God. And in that moment, he broke something in me that had been there from years of childhood trauma and pain and suffering by his love. So my name is Mark Johnston. I'm from the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Um, I do counselling. I also do courses when it comes to areas of people's lives where they're struggling, especially depression, anger, fear, anxiety, phobias, OCDs, etc. And I am the leader of the Ecclesia on the Sunshine Coast as well. Yeah, so I, I, I grew up in a country music family. So a lot of the people I was hanging out with, they were alcoholics, criminals, drug addicts, dealers, a lot of dysfunction, a lot of violence, um, Parents weren't really home much, so we were left at home alone as kids. And so, yeah, it became really just a, a sin fest, really. It's where I was sexually abused, um, mentally abused, verbally abused, physically abused as well. Yeah, I think the absence of my dad, I didn't have reasons why my dad wasn't there. My dad was quite wealthy and he didn't want anything to do with me. So the abandonment was so overwhelming. I was confused. I was lost. And I didn't have any reasons as to why I didn't want to know me. So what made that worse is my mum ended up with a gentleman who was in and out of prison and boys' homes, and he was quite violent. And so I had to go home to a very destructive lifestyle, very volatile, very violent in many, many ways, you know. It was really uncomfortable, but yet it was good at the same time because he was present more so as a father than what my real father was. So I sort of bonded to him, but also I was very unsettled at the same time because he would violently bash my mum. I remember one time in particular, I heard blood curdling screams and I ran into the room and my mum's on the floor with a knife to her throat and he's threatening to kill her. In that moment, I jumped on him to try and get him off and somehow he grabbed with his leg, he pushed me out of the room and shut the door. All I remember is bashing on the door thinking he's gonna kill mum. I was that traumatised actually that I don't even remember to this day how I got out of the situation. And when I asked my mum about the situation, she was so traumatised she couldn't even remember that she was on the ground. So that was definitely one that I'd never forget. And also he hid in the roof as well for a week. So we're in the house thinking we're safe, everything's okay. We had a baseball bat and so if anyone broke an enter would know that someone's there. But he was already up and he went through the manhole and... Um, yeah, came through the manhole one night and bashed her once again and tried to torch us alive in the house, torch the, front, the car in the front yard and tried to burn us alive. So I felt abandoned. Like there's times that even when mum separated from him, I'd go home, she wouldn't leave a note, no phone number, her whereabouts. So I'd have to search around town to try and find her. So I suffered immensely from abandonment, not just from my father, but also from my mother. Um, that really devastated me because every time I tried to convince her to come home, she would be drunk and just sort of smile and say, I love you. So my concept of love was just completely distorted. It was all messed up. So that, that would probably be one of the things that, yeah, is highlighted to me the most. But I think that the, the embarrassment, the humiliation, like being brought out in the street after, you know, um, he's torched the car in the front yard. Um, and also living in a shed with my family because um, they sold the house um, that we're in and took the furniture without even telling us. And so living in a shed was just so shaming. Like I couldn't even bring people home. And even shaming in the sense that I'd go to school and I'd go to my mates after school and ask for food and ask for even glass bottles just to sell the bottles to get money for food and, and then have a friend embarrass me in front of my mate saying that I was scabbing bottles off him to get food. That was just devastating. You know, I just seemed to come across these relationships that at the time it seemed fun. It seemed to sort of help me escape. 
So we were experimenting, chroming, you know, aerosol cans and petrol and smoke and dope and just doing everything possible that I could get my hands on just as an experiment and having fun. And up until the age of 19, um, I took that many drugs, uh, copious amounts of drugs. I was in seven drug-induced comas. The last time they put me in the coma, mum said it was the worst day she's ever seen in her life. I was tied down like a wild animal and they just kept injecting me. And they said to her if I was to come back that I'd never be the same again. I'd be permanently brain damaged. So it's sort of, it's, there was a lot of in-between. And, um, and I'm talking about, you know, eating 100 Valium in one swallow and handfuls of tablets and urinating on my mate's carpet, spitting all over on his floor because I thought I was outside, talking to myself on the street, directing traffic that wasn't there, thinking I was Jesus, hearing voices. I ended up in a mental institution at the age of 16 because I overdosed that many times. They didn't know what to do with me. You know, I was like fliffling, mixol injections, hyperperidol injections, Modicat injections, Valium injections, Mogadongs, Valium, Tamazepine, Serapax. Like I was just absolutely smashing myself, even on Prolidones and um, Cogentin tablets for the side effects of all these injections. I was just a lost cause. Like people didn't know what to do with me. People didn't know how to relate to me. I was extremely violent. Like I remember once my mate back into me on the street while cars are driving past and I threatened him with a knife to his throat and said, I'll slice your throat open if you ever back into me again. I was just full of murder. I just wanted to kill myself. I wanted to kill others. I was just full of hate. I went to my step uncle's place and um, we injected amphetamines and then he just grabbed the Bible and flicked it open and started preaching the gospel to me. So he's high on amphetamines and so am I, and me being in the good mood, I thought, oh yeah, sweet, I don't care, let's just talk all night, we'll talk about anything. So it's not like I received the gospel, it's just that I was willing to talk about it because we are high at the time. Anyway, that same uncle, he opened a gym in the local area, and I thought that they were dealing drugs from there. So I went in and thought, oh, there's a whole bunch of dealers there, so I thought, sweet, I'm in. So he took me down the back and opened the door, sat down in the seat in the office, and he goes, Mark, me and you have been very similar, lived in a you know, similar background and all this sort of stuff. And I was straight at the time, and I'm like, nah, dude, because he opened up the Bible and tried to sort of tell me about the gospel again. He sat there, and he goes, just wait a second, I'm going to grab someone. So he grabbed this other guy who I didn't know. He came and sat down, introduced him, said, hey, Mark, my name's Judd. And I said, yeah, sweet. And for the next, I reckon, half an hour to 45 minutes, I just talked and talked and talked. And as I begin to talk, this atmosphere filled the room. It's like the room disappeared and all I seen was his head. And as I stopped talking, he just looks over the table and said, Mark, do you know Jesus? And I said, no. Nah. And he goes, would you like to meet him? I said, well, I'll give it a go. See, I'm from the outback of Australia. I didn't have any sort of, I was like, I'll give it a go. And I, I repented and I believed on Jesus that day. And it felt like a, a physical blindfold got lifted off my eyes and I went out of that place praising Jesus, rode my push bike home. I wanted to tell my mum how excited I was I found Jesus. I had this love in my heart for my sister who we used to have punch-ups together. She's telling me to get out of her room. She's swearing off her head and then as I'm talking to her, her boyfriend jumps in and I automatically, out of reaction, grab him around the throat and lift him off his feet and threaten to kill him. And then I punch the glass door in. So I'm down in the hospital, not even within an hour after I gave my heart to Jesus getting stitches. <laughs> so that was my first encounter with Jesus. And I'm up the hospital getting stitches. Some people go to church and you just think, this guy's got major issues. You know, you're a misfit. You know, it's not like I sort of fit in the church. I definitely didn't look like a straighty 80. So... They seen straight away that I needed intensive help, right? So they sent me to a Christian rehabilitation. I went away for a month. I got really crook. I come back. I try to get into it. People were trying to connect. And then I just went straight back into addiction. So I believed in Jesus, but I just didn't know him. I didn't trust him. I, I, I didn't sort of really get the concept of who he was. Plus, I was around a lot of addicts and a lot of people that I knew in the town. So I just sort of got swallowed up again and went straight back into it. It sort of changed, but it sort of didn't. And that's why I've got a bit of a unique story. If anyone was going to fail at Christianity, it was me. And so God proved his faithfulness to me that undone my faithfulness towards him. So the first time I went to church, um, the night before I OD'd on heroin, I had a couple of caps of heroin. And I remember, you know, the lady laying there thinking I was on my deathbed. 
And my girlfriend from years ago, she used to go to church. She never preached at me. So I get up just thinking, you know, I'm okay, going to smoke some bongs. So I walk down the bottom of the street and here's my girlfriend, Mark, Mark, come to church, come to church. I'm like, go to church? What are you on about? I'm not going to church. And then I went home that day. I went to sleep. I kid you not, I woke up with this Mark. And I won't say her name. I'll just say her name is Kelly. Kelly asked you to go to church. Mark, Kelly asked you to go to church. And it wouldn't shut up. And I was like, it was like my own voice speaking to me, but it was calling me by name. And it to the point when I'm just like, I've got to go to the church. I can't actually sit here any longer and listen to this telling me over and over. So I went with a long sleeve. I had a skinhead, a ponytail. So I looked the part rocking up across the road from the church where I OD'd on the heroin. And I seen this old lady and old man walking up the driveway of the church. And I thought, no way I'm going into that joint. Like there's no possible way. I'm, I'm out of here. What am I even doing here? And I told him, I said, tell if Kylie's up there, tell her Mark's across the road because I didn't want to go near the church. And just about uh, as I was about to leave, uh, Kylie come down the driveway and said, Mark, come up, come up. And so I went into the church service and as soon as I walked in, people were looking at me like, oh, wow, this guy's at church and sort of they were sort of spinning a bit. And then um, probably about a week or two later, I had an encounter where the Lord um, up just above me in the church service, I felt him look at me with open arms and said, I accept you. And I just lost it. I went ballistic. I didn't care who was in the church. I was like, you accept me? You, you, you want me? I, I couldn't believe that everyone in that church looked at me weird, and yet God was the most welcoming person in the church. And I screamed at the top of my lungs, and the power of God knocked me flying off my feet. And so that was my first encounter with his power and his face. He looked at me with approval. It's interesting because I went back into addiction again. You know, had the power. And that's the whole point about power. Power doesn't change you. It's just an encounter to wake you up to actually want to know him more. But I didn't even really know that he was even trustworthy at this stage because everyone I could see wasn't trustworthy. So how could I trust someone I couldn't see, right? So I ended up smashing myself again, ended up like an old person spewing over myself for days. And then my mum said, that's it. I've had enough. Get out of here. And then they made a phone call with Kylie, the one that took me to church. They were in Sydney. And then so my mum contacted them and they said, get him to Sydney. And that's where my step uncle, the first one that I uh, just spoke about, you know, introduction to the Bible on amphetamines, he was there as well. He fried himself on the drugs and the same family took him in. So that's when I sort of got my life sorted, but I wasn't really sure if Jesus was my answer. So what happened is they were trying to get me to go to Bible study groups and worship groups and church groups. I'm like, dude, I don't know if I want all this Jesus stuff. Like I just, I'm, I'm messed up. You can see that. Anyway, so they got frustrated with me and they said, go and speak to Johnny at the sink. So Johnny at this stage, he's at the sink and we're just talking because we know each other. And then he just turns around and quotes John 3.3. 3. He said, Mark, he said, the, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. And he quoted John 3.5. He said, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born in water of spirit. And he quoted John 3, 16, he said, God so loved this world that he gave his one and only son, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And I thought, man, I don't know what these other guys are telling me, but I want to know what the Bible says. So I, I rode home on the push bike that day, open to what I thought was the book of um, Palms. I found out later it was the book of Psalms in chapter 72. And I had an encounter. The Lord uh, face to face told me out of Psalms chapter 72, verse 14, he told me personally he was going to rescue me from oppression, violence and fraud because precious was my blood in his sight. So that had a bit of a reaction in me to the point where I just wanted to know what the truth was. And then again, after many years, I wasn't fully sold out for Jesus. Uh, pornography, even going to the strippers, going into King's Cross. I ended up, back, ended up back in addiction after trying to serve Jesus and live for Jesus, but I was just messed up, man. I just couldn't seem to get myself on track. How do you go from such a messed up place? You can see that your heart is for Jesus, but you're not living that way. How do you reconcile that and how do you come out of that? There's so many people out there that are struggling with this right now and they feel like they're never going to make it. How did you make it out of there? I think I made it out eventually because I was cornered. See, most people in addiction, they avoid pain. They've had enough pain in life, so why would I want to serve Jesus? 
picking up my cross and denying myself and following after him can actually be more burdensome than, you know, trying to, it's trying to connect freedom with Jesus sometimes doesn't sort of make sense for a person that's been through pain. So for me, coming back, um, I really struggled handing myself over to Jesus because I thought, Jesus, it's like you're a crutch. It's like church. I can't stay in church. I'm flipping over church people. I don't like people at church. But what I realized is 80% of my mental struggles was because I was fighting the wrong fight. So I remember six months in the rehabilitation because you say what changed my life? It was rehabilitation. And I remember walking back from the beach and I was at the lights and that verse that says, submit to God, resist the devil and flee. He will flee from you. And as I was quoting this verse, I had a light bulb moment. And I'm like, are you telling me that if I submit to you first, that I will resist the devil and then he will flee? And it dawned on me that 80% of my mental struggles was present because I was trying to fight the devil, but I didn't want to submit to God. I didn't want to suffer. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to do it his way. And at the lights, I said, well, that's it. I lay down my life right here, right now, and I surrender and submit everything to you. Hell or high water, I don't care what I have to go through. I'm going to live for you and I'm going to submit to you. And I walked straight back into the rehabilitation and I said, there's two things because we had a pulpit. I said, number one, I said, I'm going to finish this program. And number two, I'm going to become a house supervisor. And then all hell broke loose and uh, God took me through an amazing process. And one year and three weeks, I completed, completed the um, discipleship program. Never looked back 14 years later. I actually finished for the first time in my life. I finished rehabilitation out of all things. The first thing I've ever finished in my life. And when I finished that, I'd done an apprenticeship with tiling. And when I finished that, I'd done counselling. And it's just taken off from there. So, All right, so where things changed for me, I could not stop talking and thinking about drugs. Like people saying, you know, you need to give your life to Jesus again, sort this out. This is early stages of my recovery. And I couldn't get the consuming thoughts of just being a junkie for the rest of my life. I thought I'm a done deal. I'm finished, I'm cooked. There's no other options for me, right? But I had this dream, because what I didn't tell you is that I actually gave my life, I got down on my knees and surrendered my life to a sorcerer, because I wanted him to teach me how to cook methamphetamines. So when I opened myself up to him, what happened in true rehab, I didn't realize that that attachment to the drugs was the open door and I allowed that spirit to come in. So I had a dream one night as I was trying to drown out all the thoughts about drugs. I had a dream, and in this dream, this sorcerer was at the kitchen sink, and he turns around, and he's got a pot in his hand stirring it, and he walks across the kitchen towards me, and it blows up in his own face. From that day onwards, the overwhelming pressure, the just the consuming thoughts of taking drugs broke off my life. That was a defining moment. The other moment too is I had a dream and God actually started speaking to me in dreams and visions. Um, I have dreams and visions every night now. And in this particular one, he took me into a trance and he showed me in the early stages of a relationship that I had with a female that uh, in the trance, she was a rainbow with a python coming out of her being and it was wrapping around my arms in this trance. And he was showing me that this is a false promise from him that it was going to strangle the life out of me. So I started seeing God move in such profound ways. And even to the point where I went over to my brother's house and I had a dream that he hid $20,000 in his roof. And uh, when I told him about that, he freaked out. He's like, like nearly dropped over dead because there was actually $20,000 cash in his roof. So God started revealing things to me and speaking to me in profound ways. And then I went overseas. Um, I got invited to... Uh, a crusade with Tim Hall uh, and got to tell my testimony in front of like fifteen to 20,000 people, which is really interesting, right? Because God gave me that open vision when I first got saved. He gave me an open vision 15 years later, it came to pass. And I actually see myself the exact same way as I see myself in the open vision. So that tells you a lot about visions. If God shows you something, it, it actually will come to pass. And so uh, when I was pointing my finger at the crowd, that's exactly as it was uh, with the open vision. And I didn't even know I was a preacher. 
didn't even know I was called. Didn't even know that God had a mission that he wanted to accomplish on my life. So so that sort of happened. And then I just uh, continued to work in rehabilitation. I was a supervisor, case manager, program coordinator, and I was a director for six months. And just working with people that are like prostitutes, pimps, cooks, jailbirds, armed robbers, people that have been like just really messed up in life. And so that was really the foundation. And as soon as that foundation got built, man, my gosh, just went off like a rocket. That's where I just started getting into the deeper stuff and running schools and my own courses and doing counseling. And like my family are radically saved. Like I'm talking about, man, I was punching cones with my nana. She was 72 years of age dealing drugs, smoking cones with her, and she's been gloriously saved today. My auntie was on methamphetamines and Jesus was speaking to her. She gets miraculously saved. She goes to a mental institution. She's talking to me and today she's been completely set free. I've got another auntie who was like a prostitute and just really messed up. Another uncle in prison. Jesus spoke to him through the TV. I've got another cousin that went to jail for murder, nearly killed my auntie and chopped up his best mate. He gave his heart to Jesus in prison. And even now on the Sunshine Coast, I do every second Monday night, I'm actually discipling my family and taking them through a discipleship process where they're getting set free and on fire for Jesus. Like it's absolutely phenomenal. My sister got saved because I interpreted a dream as well. Interpreted a dream and, and, and it was so bang on that she said, obviously God's speaking to me, I have to give my life to Jesus, and she's never looked back. So all my family have come to Christ pretty much ever since then as well. So uh, when it comes to healing signs, wonders, and miracles, I have seen some profound things uh, manifested in front of me. For example, when we were over in Papua New Guinea, there was kids preaching on the street, and I thought, we need to prove the kingdom. And I remember there was a big circle of people, and I got in the center, and I said, is there anyone here you got a leg shorter than the other? And everyone was going quiet and there was nothing happening. And the next minute, this little kid walks through the center of the crowd and he's walking like he's almost got a three-quarter leg. It was that bad. And I went, grab him. And so we grabbed him. We set him up on this little uh, rock fence looking thing, prayed for him. And after I prayed for him, I said, tell him to start walking again. And as he began to walk, I literally seen a recreative miracle take place on the spot. I seen his leg grow out as he began to walk. And then I told him to run and his leg got loosed miraculously as he began to run. So there's a working of miracles manifesting. And as he's running back, one of his arms is completely paralyzed. It's not swinging. And so we end up praying for him again. And I told him to lift his arm and his arm got completely healed from being paralyzed. He put his head down and began to weep. And I literally felt like I was in the days of Jesus. That little boy was sold for 50 cents in the marketplace. He was in a car accident and smashed up his arm and his leg. So that was one notable miracle. Um, also, when I was in Papua New Guinea too, like preaching at one of the churches, I felt like there was a portal over my life. Like I literally felt like there was a beam of glory on me and the power of God began to manifest in a way that I've never seen before. As I prayed for the people, I heard this lady screaming out in the service. She had a cancer lump that was the size of a tennis ball. When the power and the glory of the Spirit of God came, it literally melted instantaneously out of her breast. She was completely healed in the service. And everyone just erupted and the power of God just started manifesting on everyone. So that was another time when I seen God's miraculous power at work as well. Uh, the list goes on as well. I remember another time I was at Glory Jeans and um, there was this lady in the chair. I didn't even realize that there was a wheelchair next to the lounge chair. And and she's, she's watching me read this book. And um, I was getting sort of a bit annoyed because it was like she wanted to talk to me. She goes, oh, what are you reading? I said, oh, the book of Philippians. And she goes, oh, that's exciting. And she started talking about um, her back and how it hurt and um, she had all these new age and you know diviners and all these sort of spiritist people praying for her and she still saw and I said would you like me to pray for it and she goes yeah for sure and so I asked the guy at Gloria Jeans I said yeah, yeah okay if I I pray for this lady and he goes man have the whole shop so here we are in Gloria Jeans at a coffee shop and I put my hand on the back the pain left the back see I didn't even realize the wheelchair was next to the lounge I didn't even know that she was in a wheelchair because I was wondering why she was dragging herself across the land. I'm thinking, why are you being so lazy? I didn't realize what was going on. And next minute, the pain left, and I said, get up. And she's freaking out. My mate was with me at the time, 
He's like, nah, dude, don't, don't, don't get her to stand. I said, nah, get up. And I walked her across Gloria uh, Jean's um, coffee shop and she's walking, freaking out. And my mate turns around, like, as, as I turn around, my mate's going, nah, man, let her sit down. I said, be quiet. I said, now walk by yourself. And I'm telling you, as soon as I said walk by yourself, it's like the heavens cracked open and it was like this network of miracles. God just opened this gift of faith over the room and she got miraculously healed from the wheelchair and she began to walk herself. So that was another time too that I seen God move in a powerful way. What about um, seeing the power of God move in your own life in terms of healing the traumas of growing up or deliverance for yourself um, or even coming into the gifts of the Spirit for yourself as well? Yeah, I'm reminded of a time when I was going through a very um, difficult season and I was trying to worship the Lord, pray. We're in a a full-fledged church service. There was a guest ministry there and it's like a brass ceiling. I couldn't describe it like it was so difficult. And I was doing everything the Bible said to do, but it just just nothing was happening. And this preacher, he stopped mid-service and he said, there's someone here, it's like you're pushing a safe through the sand. And I thought, that's me. And I usually don't go down the front, but I just went straight down the front. And it's like the Holy Spirit, that's the only way I can describe it. It's like the Holy Spirit jumped off the stage and just went bam and punched me clean in the like the spirit in my spirit and I instantly buckled and I had these pair of eyes appear to me outside of my body they were like white translucent eyes and as these eyes were there it was looking at me and I felt this transference of hot liquid love flushing through my spirit just waves of this love rushing through these eyes and as he was looking at me it was like a, he gave me a, a vision of my childhood at the same time while his eyes were looking at me of where I missed it and where I failed and where I made mistakes and where I got it wrong. And then his eyes tweaked like this innocence towards me and I just broke. I was smashed to pieces and undone by the love of the Spirit of God. And in that moment, he broke something in me that had been there from years of childhood trauma and pain and suffering by his love. And the part that broke me the most is I actually felt completely innocent in his eyes. After all the bad things I've done, I actually felt like I had done no wrong in his eyes. And so that was one of the moments in my life that absolutely turned me upside down. Another time um, that was quite profound is uh, when the Holy Spirit manifested to me as a person. Um, Leading up to that, Uh, Many people were saying that I was an evangelist because of my testimony and they sort of, I suppose, labelled me as the emotional guy to help people through their trauma and all their pain. But um, I I was curious, it's like, what gift have I got? Like, what have you called me as? Because I couldn't quite put my finger on it because I was almost evangelistic. I could preach the word of God in and out of season. Um, Pastoral because I work with broken people. Um, and then I had this prophetic gifting. I seemed to want to prophesy and I had dreams and visions every night. And I'm like, I just couldn't work out what the heck I was. And then someone's turned around and said, oh, you apostolic because I established campuses and I built things from scratch and got them moving. So I was sort of a bit sort of in between and the church wasn't really helping me in that process. I remember going to a church service and uh, after the church service, this old gentleman, I don't even know who he was, um, from my side, I heard his croaky old voice, and all I heard was, you're a prophet. And as I heard that voice, in front of me, where another gentleman was standing, about my height, and as a person, the Holy Spirit manifested as a person. I couldn't see him, I could feel him as a person. And he come at me like lightning speed. As soon as that man said, you're a prophet, the Holy Spirit went up in my face and pointed his finger into into my face and I could feel his eyes upon my eyes and he said, you're a prophet with his spirit voice. So the spirit of God spoke to me from his spirit voice at the exact same time as the man spoke from the natural voice and the power of God just went boof and just absolutely smashed me. So I had this encounter with the Holy Spirit. And uh, that's what changed my whole perspective. I started sort of meditating on that more. But sadly, it took me about five years to even accept that uh, that's what he called me to do. I really believe God has called me to make disciples. He's also called me to set the captives free. 
I do believe that the spirit of his deliverance is on my life. I do believe he's given me scriptural and spiritual intelligence to undo the complex issues that people struggle with. So today I'm helping people understand the roots of depression from a scriptural perspective. I'm helping them understand uh, the roots of fear and anxiety. And so a big part of my process is it's not enough just to preach at people. I've got to be able to give them the specialized tools so that they can find their own freedom. So I'm a big fan of getting people into the word of God, into the things of the spirit, about seeing them get the upgrade that they need, get the upskilling, the how-to, so that they can walk through life more successfully. So today it's more about equipping. It's more about seeing people uh, stepping into their gifting. It's not necessarily what I want. It's more like, what are you called to do? What are you anointed to do? And to really just, just have the freedom and the access to sort of just be themselves and instead of trying to make them like me or make them like someone else or make them look nice and pretty, I'd rather them just express their own unique abilities and giftings. So that's that's my heart today. And the power of God. Like, I want to see the glory of the Lord. Like, I'm telling you, man, I want to see the glory of the Lord. Like, I've got nothing else in my mind and my heart. I'm absolutely consumed with wanting to see the glory of the Lord. I want to see him move in his church. I want to see him move on the streets. I want to see him move in a way that is less spoken about and more expressed and there's more evidence of what he's doing instead of people just trying to talk about it. I want it there to be this habitual abiding presence where there's a sense of holiness and the fear of the Lord and there's character and there's authentic change. I'm over the inauthentic change in believers. And it's interesting because I had so much issues in my life and now I'm just so determined to see people set free so that they don't have to go through all the process I went through. So what advice do you have for people who, like you, have been, maybe they know Jesus or they've had an encounter with God one way or another, but they're still struggling with things like addiction or just really coming to know who Jesus is as a person and as their Lord and Savior. What advice do you have for people going through that struggle right now? No matter how painful it is, Get into a place where the community embraces you, they love you, they support you, they do rebuke you, they correct you, and don't see it as something bad. See it as a part of the process to see restoration in your life. You say, Mark, how did I end up here? Because people corrected me. People told me things I didn't want to hear. People treated me a certain way, but I'm still here today to tell you that Jesus is the most amazing person I've ever met in my life, and I'm never turning back. So... That's what I'd encourage you with. Never take your eyes off Jesus. And love the church because the devil wants you to hate church. He wants to get you away from church. How do you succeed? Don't stay away from church. That's how you succeed. Yeah, but church sucks. That's the point. Keep rocking up anyway and God will give you a love for the bride. And by the way, I remember one day God challenged me. He said, Mark, you love me, but you don't love me bride. I've got a problem with that. So I actually started loving the people I didn't really like. So that's when you know you're changing, when you love the people that you don't like. And you love the people like people that have said to me, you're a false prophet, you're a fox, you're a snake, you're a wolf in sheep's clothing. They say all kinds of things against you. But that doesn't determine where I go as far as, you know, in this life. It determines what I want for the next life. I'm actually looking to Jesus and getting my security from him. If he says I'm a son of God, it doesn't matter what they say. If he says I'm righteous, it doesn't matter if they say I'm unrighteous. If he says I'm accepted, then I'm accepted. If he says I'm holy, I'm holy. If he says I'm a saint, I'm a saint. So at the end of the day, they can look at me and say, oh, you don't fit the church. I don't care what they say. I fit exactly where God wants me to fit. Look at this. Look at this guy right here. I am a saint. That's right. You better believe it. I'm a saint. And guess what? So are you. So, Mark, thanks again for sharing your testimony with us. I just want to invite you now to just to, to pray for everyone who's been watching. Yeah, Lord Jesus, I um, praise your magnificent name. I lift up every single person that is on this feed right now. And I thank you for your yoke-destroying, burden-removing power. I pray the power of God that rose Christ from the dead, that same power is coming upon them right now. Every single spirit under the sound of my voice, Every seducing, familiar spirit, every spirit that has kept them in bondage, 
every spirit of addiction, every spirit, Father God, that has stopped them and blocked them and hindered them away from you, in the mighty name of Jesus, by the authority of the name of Jesus, I command you to leave their life. Father, I just want to say thank you that your love is overwhelming them right now. I thank you for touching them, releasing them, healing them, delivering them, preserving them, prospering them, aiding them. I thank you for releasing them. I thank you, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, that you have a plan, you have a purpose, you have a destiny for each and every person to be fulfilled. And Lord, even that spirit of despair, I command you in the mighty name of Jesus, lift off their life. That spirit that says there's no hope, that spirit that says, what's the point of continuing? Even the spirit of suicide that naggles and haggles them every day. Father, I thank you for breaking its power right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Even people with pornography. Lord, I speak to that unclean spirit and I charge you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, get off their soul and get away from their spirit. Where they're being polluted in spirit and flesh, I thank you for the cleansing power and the blood of Jesus transferring right now. And I pray, Lord Jesus, what you've put upon my life, I pray that same power to touch them right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Every thought, every wall, every method, every scheme, every dark imagination, everything that exalts itself against the true wisdom and knowledge of the word of God, I take you captive in the mighty name of Jesus. And I speak the fire of God and the glory of God and miracles, signs and wonders to touch your body right now. I command sickness and disease, infirmities, go in Jesus' name right now, in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Even people that have had unprocessed grief, I can see it right now, sitting in their gut, the pain sitting in them, perpetual pain, they can't get rid of it. I speak to you in the name of Jesus and I command you, be released in your spirit. Be released to bond to the Father in this time in your life. In Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Prince of Peace, touching your people. Crushing Satan. Removing the accuser. Destroying his foothold. Removing the devices that have held him captive. In your precious name. 